This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com. The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. Chapter 12 How Many Kinds of Soldiery There Are, and Concerning Mercenaries. Having discoursed particularly on the characteristics of such principalities as in the beginning I proposed to discuss, and having considered in some degree the causes of their being good or bad, and having shown the methods by which many have sought to acquire them and to hold them, it now remains for me to discuss generally the means of offence and defence which belong to each of them. We have seen above how necessary it is for a prince to have his foundations well laid. Otherwise it follows of necessity he will go to ruin. The chief foundations of all states, new as well as old or composite, are good laws and good arms. And as there cannot be good laws where the state is not well armed, it follows that where they are well armed they have good laws. I shall leave the laws out of the discussion, and shall speak of the arms. I say, therefore, that the arms with which a prince defends his state are either his own, or they are mercenaries, auxiliaries, or mixed. Mercenaries and auxiliaries are useless and dangerous, and if one holds his state based on these arms he will stand neither firm nor safe, for they are disunited, ambitious, and without discipline unfaithful, valiant before friends, cowardly before enemies. They have neither the fear of God nor fidelity to men, and destruction is deferred only so long as the attack is. For in peace one is robbed by them, and in war by the enemy. The fact is, they have no other attraction or reason for keeping the field than a trifle of stipend, which is not sufficient to make them willing to die for you. They are ready enough to be your soldiers whilst you do not make war, but if war comes they take themselves off or run from the foe. Which I should have little trouble to prove, for the ruin of Italy has been caused by nothing else than by resting all her hopes for many years on mercenaries. And although they formerly made some display and appeared valiant amongst themselves, yet when the foreigners came they showed what they were. Thus it was that Charles, King of France, was allowed to seize Italy with chalk in hand. Begin note. With chalk in hand, called gesso. This is one of the bon mots of Alexander the Sixth, and refers to the ease with which Charles the Eighth seized Italy, implying that it was only necessary for him to send his quartermasters to chalk up the billets for his soldiers to conquer the country. C.F. The History of Henry the Seventh by Lord Bacon. King Charles had conquered the realm of Naples, and lost it again in a kind of felicity of a dream. He passed the whole length of Italy without resistance, so that it was true what Pope Alexander was wont to say, that the Frenchmen came into Italy with chalk in their hands to mark up their lodgings rather than with swords to fight. End note. Thus it was that Charles, King of France, was allowed to seize Italy with chalk in hand. And he who told us that our sins were the cause of it told the truth, but they were not the sins he imagined, but those which I have related. And as they were the sins of princes, it is the princes who have also suffered the penalty. I wish to demonstrate further the infelicity of these arms. The mercenary captains are either capable men or they are not. If they are, you cannot trust them, because they always aspire to their own greatness, either by oppressing you, who are their master, or others contrary to your intentions. But if the captain is not skilful, you are ruined in the usual way. And if it be urged that whoever is armed will act in the same way, whether mercenary or not, I reply that when arms have to be resorted to, either by a prince or a republic, then the prince ought to go in person and perform the duty of a captain. 
the Republic has to send its citizens, and when one is sent who does not turn out satisfactorily, it ought to recall him, and when one is worthy, to hold him by the law so that he does not leave the command. And experience has shown princes and republics, single-handed, making the greatest progress, and mercenaries doing nothing except damage. And it is more difficult to bring a republic, armed with its own arms, under the sway of one of its citizens, than it is to bring one armed with foreign arms. Rome and Sparta stood for many ages armed and free. The Switzers are completely armed and quite free. Of ancient mercenaries, for example, there are the Carthaginians, who were oppressed by their mercenary soldiers after the first war with the Romans, although the Carthaginians had their own citizens for captains. After the death of Epaminondas, Philip of Macedon was made captain of their soldiers by the Thebans, and after victory he took away their liberty. Duke Filippo being dead, the Milanese enlisted Francesco Sforza against the Venetians, and he, having overcome the enemy at Caravaggio, begin note, Battle of Caravaggio, 15th September, 1448, end note, and he, having overcome the enemy at Caravaggio, allied himself with them to crush the Milanese, his masters. His father, Sforza, having been engaged by Queen Johanna of Naples, begin note, Johanna the Second of Naples, the widow of Ladislao, King of Naples, end note, left her unprotected, so that she was forced to throw herself into the arms of the King of Aragon, in order to save her kingdom. And if the Venetians and the Florentines formally extended their dominion by these arms, and yet their captains did not make themselves princes, but have defended them, I reply that the Florentines in this case have been favoured by chance, for of the able captains of whom they might have stood in fear, some have not conquered, some have been opposed, and others have turned their ambitions elsewhere. One who did not conquer was Giovanni Acuto. Begin note. Giovanni Acuto, an English knight whose name was Sir John Hawkwood. He fought in the English wars in France, and was knighted by Edward the Third. Afterwards he collected a body of troops and went into Italy. These became the famous White Company. He took part in many wars and died in Florence in 1394. He was born about 1320 at Seibel Headingham, a village in Essex. He married Domnia, a daughter of Bernabo Visconti. End note. One who did not conquer was Giovanni Acuto, and since he did not conquer his fidelity cannot be proved. But every one will acknowledge that, had he conquered, the Florentines would have stood at his discretion. Sforza had the Brakeshi always against him, so they watched each other. Francesco turned his ambition to Lombardy, Braccio against the church and the kingdom of Naples. But let us come to that which happened a short while ago. The Florentines appointed as their captain Pagolo Fitelli, a most prudent man, who from a private position had risen to the greatest renown. If this man had taken Pisa, nobody can deny that it would have been proper for the Florentines to keep in with him, for if he became the soldier of their enemies, they had no means of resisting and if they held to him they must obey him. The Venetians, if their achievements are considered, will be seen to have acted safely and gloriously so long as they sent to war their own men, when with armed gentlemen and plebeians they did valiantly. This was before they turned to enterprises on land, but when they began to fight on land they forsook this virtue, and followed the custom of Italy and in the beginning of their expansion on land, through not having much territory, and because of their great reputation, they had not much to fear from their captains. But when they expanded as under Carmignuola, begin note, Carmignuola, Francesco Busson, born at Carmignuola about 1390, executed at Venice, 5th of May, 1432. But when they expanded as under Carmignuola, they had a taste of this mistake, for having found him a most valiant man, they beat the Duke of Milan under his leadership, and on the other hand, knowing how lukewarm he was in the war, they feared they would no longer conquer under him, and for this reason they were not willing, 
nor were they able to let him go. And so, not to lose again that which they had acquired, they were compelled, in order to secure themselves, to murder him. They had afterwards for their captains Bartolomeo de Bargamo, Roberto de San Severino, the Count of Pitigliano, begin note, Bartolomeo Colioni of Bergamo, died 1457, Roberto of San Severino, died fighting for Venice against Sigismund, Duke of Austria in 1487, Primo Capitano in Italia, Machiavelli, Count of Pitigliano, Niccolo Orsini, born 1442, died 1510. End note. And the like, under whom they had to dread loss and not gain, as happened afterwards at Valia. Begin note. Battle of Valia in 1509. As happened afterwards at Valia, where in one battle they lost that which in eight hundred years they had acquired with so much trouble because from such arms conquests come but slowly, long delayed and inconsiderable, but the loss is sudden and portentous. And as with these examples I have reached Italy, which has been ruled for many years by mercenaries, I wish to discuss them more seriously, in order that, having seen their rise and progress, one may be better prepared to counteract them. You must understand that the empire has recently come to be repudiated in Italy, that the Pope has acquired more temporal power, and that Italy has been divided up into more states for the reason that many of the great cities took up arms against their nobles, who, formerly favored by the Emperor, were oppressing them, whilst the Church was favoring them so as to gain authority in temporal power. And many others their citizens became princes. From this it came to pass that Italy fell partly into the hands of the Church, and of republics, and the church consisting of priests, and the republic of citizens unaccustomed to arms, both commenced to enlist foreigners. The first to give renown to this soldiery was Albrigio da Cogno. Begin note. Albrigio da Cogno, Alberico da Barbiano, Count of Cugno in Romagna. He was the leader of the famous Company of St. George, composed entirely of Italian soldiers. He died in 1409. The Romanian. From the school of this man sprang, among others, Braccio and Sforza, who in their time were the arbiters of Italy. After these came all the other captains who till now have directed the arms of Italy. And the end of all their valor has been that she has been overrun by Charles, robbed by Louis, ravaged by Ferdinand, and insulted by the Switzers. The principle that has guided them has been at first to lower the credit of infantry, so that they might increase their own. They did this because, subsisting on their pay, and without territory, they were unable to support many soldiers, and a few infantry did not give them any authority. So they were led to employ cavalry, with a moderate force of which they were maintained and honored. And affairs were brought to such a pass that in an army of twenty thousand soldiers there were not to be found two thousand foot soldiers. They had, besides this, used every art to lessen fatigue and danger to themselves and their soldiers, not killing in the fray, but taking prisoners and liberating without ransom. They did not attack towns at night, nor did the garrisons of the towns attack encampments at night. They did not surround the camp either with stockade or ditch nor did they campaign in the winter. All these things were permitted by their military rules, and devised by them to avoid, as I have said, both fatigue and dangers. Thus they have brought Italy to slavery and contempt. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 Concerning Auxiliaries, Mixed Soldiery and One's Own Auxiliaries, which are the other useless arm, are employed when a prince is called in with his forces to aid and defend, as was done by Pope Julius in the most recent times, for he, having in the enterprise against Ferrara, had poor proof of his mercenaries, turned to auxiliaries, and stipulated with Ferdinand, King of Spain, for his assistance with men and arms. Begin note. Ferdinand V. Ferdinand II of Aragon and Sicily. 
Ferdinand the Third of Naples, surnamed the Catholic, born 1542, died 1516. These arms may be useful and good in themselves, but for him who calls them in they are always disadvantageous. For losing one is undone, and winning one is their captive. And although ancient histories may be full of examples, I do not wish to leave this recent one of Pope Julius the Second, the peril of which cannot fail to be perceived, for he, wishing to get Ferrara, threw himself entirely into the hands of the foreigner. But his good fortune brought about a third event, so that he did not reap the fruit of his rash choice. Because having his auxiliaries routed at Ravenna, and the Switzers having risen and driven out the conquerors, against all expectation both his and others, it so came to pass that he did not become prisoner to his enemies, they having fled, nor to his auxiliaries, he having conquered by other arms than theirs. The Florentines, being entirely without arms, sent ten thousand Frenchmen to take Pisa, whereby they ran more danger than at any other time of their troubles. The Emperor of Constantinople, begin note, Joannes Canta Cusenas, born 1300, died 1383, end note. The Emperor of Constantinople, to oppose his neighbors, sent ten thousand Turks into Greece, who, on the war being finished, were not willing to quit. This was the beginning of the servitude of Greece to the infidels. Therefore let him who has no desire to conquer make use of these arms, for they are much more hazardous than mercenaries, because with them the ruin is ready-made. They are all united, all yield obedience to others, but with mercenaries, when they have conquered, more time and better opportunities are needed to injure you. They are not all of one community. They are found and paid by you, and a third party, which you have made their head, is not able all at once to assume enough authority to injure you. In conclusion, in mercenaries dastardy is most dangerous, in auxiliaries valor. The wise prince, therefore, has always avoided these arms and turned to his own, and has been willing rather to lose with them than to conquer with the others, not deeming that a real victory which is gained with the arms of others. I shall never hesitate to cite Cesar Borgia and his actions. This duke entered the Romagna with auxiliaries, taking there only French soldiers, and with them he captured Emola and Forli. But afterward, such forces not appearing to him reliable, he turned to mercenaries, discerning less danger in them, and enlisted the Orsini and Vitelli, whom presently, on handling and finding them doubtful, unfaithful, and dangerous, he destroyed and turned to his own men. And the difference between one and the other of these forces can easily be seen when one considers the difference there was in the reputation of the duke. When he had the French, when he had the Orsini and Vitelli, and when he relied on his own soldiers, on whose fidelity he could always count and found it ever increasing, he was never esteemed more highly than when every one saw that he was complete master of his own forces. I was not intending to go beyond Italian and recent examples, but I am unwilling to leave out Hiero, the Syracusan, he being one of those I have named above. This man, as I have said, made head of the army by the Syracusans, soon found out that a mercenary soldiery, constituted like our Italian condottieri, was of no use, and it appearing to him that he could neither keep them nor let them go, he had them all cut to pieces and afterwards made war with his own forces, and not with aliens. I wish also to recall to memory an instance from the Old Testament applicable to this subject. David offered himself to Saul to fight with Goliath, the Philistine champion, and to give him courage Saul armed him with his own weapons, which David rejected as soon as he had them on his back saying he could make no use of them, and that he wished to meet the enemy with his sling and his knife. In conclusion, the arms of others either fall from your back, or they weigh you down, or they bind you fast. Charles the Seventh, begin note, 
Charles the Seventh of France, surnamed the Victorious, born 1403, died 1461. End note. The father of King Louis the Eleventh. Begin note. Louis the Eleventh, son of the above, born 1423, died 1483. End note. Having by good fortune and valor liberated France from the English, recognized the necessity of being armed with forces of his own, and he established in his kingdom ordinances concerning men-at-arms and infantry. Afterwards his son, King Louis, abolished the infantry and began to enlist the Switzers, which mistake, followed by others, is, as is now seen, a source of peril to that kingdom. Because having raised the reputation of the Switzers, he has entirely diminished the value of his own arms, for he has destroyed the infantry altogether, and his men-at-arms he has subordinated to others, for being as they are so accustomed to fight along with Switzers, it does not appear that they can now conquer without them. Hence it arises that the French cannot stand against the Switzers, and without the Switzers they do not come off well against others. The armies of the French have thus become mixed, partly mercenary and partly national, both of which arms together are much better than mercenaries alone, or auxiliaries alone, but much inferior to one's own forces. And this example proves it, for the kingdom of France would be unconquerable if the ordinance of Charles had been enlarged or maintained. But the scanty wisdom of man on entering into a, an affair which looks well at first cannot discern the poison that is hidden in it, as I have said above of hectic fevers. Therefore, if he who rules a principality cannot recognize evils until they are upon him, he is not truly wise. And this insight is given to few. And if the first disaster to the Roman Empire should be examined, it will be found to have commenced only with the enlisting of the Goths, because from that time the vigor of the Roman Empire began to decline, and all that valor which had raised it passed away to others. Begin note, in quotations. Many speakers to the House the other night in the debate on the reduction of armaments seem to know a most lamentable ignorance of the conditions under which the British Empire maintains its existence. When Mr. Balfour replied to the allegations that the Roman Empire sank under the weight of its military obligations, he said that this was wholly unhistorical. He might well have added that the Roman power was at its zenith when every citizen acknowledged his liability to fight for the state but that it began to decline as soon as this obligation was no longer recognized. Paul Mall Gazette, 15th of May, 1906 End note I conclude, therefore, that no principality is secure without having its own forces. On the contrary, it is entirely dependent on good fortune, not having the valor which in adversity would defend it and it has always been the opinion and judgment of wise men that nothing can be so uncertain or unstable as fame or power not founded on its own strength. And one's own forces are those which are composed either of subjects, citizens, or dependents, all others mercenaries or auxiliaries. And the way to make ready one's own forces will be easily found if the rules suggested by me shall be reflected upon and if one will consider how Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, and many republics and princes have armed and organized themselves, to which rules I entirely commit myself. End of chapter 13